my apologies. Good morning, councillors. Uh, can I first of all say, uh, could you make sure that uh, you're aware that the meeting will be streamed live via Microsoft Teams and the recording will be publicly available on the council's website following the meeting? And please make sure that all the electronic equipment is in silent mode. And I have to say it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to this, the very first virtual meeting of full council. This wonderful technology, which is now available, means that we can now communicate together in the comfort of our own homes safely. This has been an unusual and very worrying past few months for all of our constituents and our families. And this is a time which none of us will ever forget. So I'm really pleased that so many councillors are in attendance today. And I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Chief Executive and all our officers and staff who have been working so hard behind the scenes during this pandemic. I would also like to congratulate Councillor Willie Wilson, who has just celebrated 40 years as a councillor on Perth and Cross Council. An amazing length of time. At the end of March, we were all saddened by the death of our friend and colleague, former Deputy Provost Council Bob Band after an extremely brave battle with cancer. I first knew Bob when we were first elected onto the council 13 years ago, and I've never known anyone who had a bad word to say about him. We will have an opportunity to speak and to honour Bob at a memorial service uh, in the near future, which I'm sure most of everybody here will want to attend. Councillors, as the Council is currently operating under emergency powers, I will now hand over to Karen Reid, Chief Executive, to take members through the business on the agenda today. Thank you. Thank Karen. you, Forrest, and for your kind words. Good morning, councillors and colleagues. Um, the first thing I would like to do this morning is to ask Scott to undertake a roll call of everyone present so we can formally record in the minute. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Can I ask you that when I read out your name to unmute your microphone and to say yes to confirm that you are present? Councillor Ahern. Yes, present. Councillor Anderson. Yes. Councillor Bailey. Present. Deputy Provost Beard. Yes. Councillor Barnacle. Yes. Councillor Barrett. Yes. Councillor Braun. Yes, present. Councillor Brock, I understand we may have been having some issues. Um, yes, I'm here. Yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Audrey Coates. Present. Councillor Harry Coates. Present. Councillor Donaldson. Present. Councillor Drysdale. Yes. Councillor Duff. Present. Councillor Forbes. Present. Councillor Gray. Mm. Councillor Ellingworth. Present. Councillor James. Yes, present. Councillor Jarvis. Present. Councillor Lane. Present. Councillor Lyle. Yes. Councillor McCall. Yes. Councillor McCall. Yes. Councillor McDade. Present. Councillor McEwen. Yes. Councillor Parrott. Yes. Councillor Pover. Yes, present. Councillor Purvis. Present. Councillor Rebeck. Present. Councillor Reid. Present. Councillor Robertson. Present. We have apologies from Councillor Sarwar and Councillor Shires. Councillor Simpson. Yes. Councillor Stewart. Present. Councillor Waters. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Present. And Councillor Wilson. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Can I ask if any elected member has a declaration of interest to make. If you do, please note in the chat function DI, the letters DI, and I will bring you in to make that public declaration. Thank you. Oh, 
Okay, given that I have not received any notification, I'll now proceed on with the agenda. Provost councillors, firstly, I would like to say how proud I am of the efforts of our volunteers, our community groups, our citizens, our businesses, for the way in which they have supported people across our communities. I'd also like to say I've never, ever been prouder of our staff across the Council in the way that they have risen to the challenge of COVID-19 and gone the extra mile to support the most vulnerable people in our communities and keep essential Council services running. So thank you all for that. I'd also like to commend elected members for all the work that you have been doing in your local communities and indeed the support you have given to me and officers across the Council. So thank you so much for that. Moving on with the agenda items, you will know that we are working under emergency powers at the moment to manage the pandemic and the impact it is having on our communities and indeed the Council. As such, we have implemented an emergency and resilience planning structure, which is absolutely normal in the circumstances, which has gold, silver and bronze command to manage our business. So on that note, I'm actually going to ask our gold commander, Barbara Renton, to take us through some of the key operational updates. I would like to draw your attention, please, to the appendices under item four that will have given you a flavour of all the different activities that have happened across the Council of late. However, Barbara will start and I'm sure she'll be supported by both Sheena Devlin, Karen Donaldson and Gordon Patterson. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, Barbara, are you nope. able to come in? Yes, I had nope. I think that I was just waiting to be unmuted by IT there. Thank you. Um, as as you've highlighted, you know, sort of there are a number of appendices, you know, sort of attached to the the report um, which follows this item on the agenda. Um, there's an awful lot of information on those, so I've only wanted to concentrate on the highlights. So the first of those is the fact that the you know sort of gold command you know sort of identified 18 essential services for the council to continue to focus on and in summary these were chosen to cover the following arrangements emergency services delivered by the council delivering services to the most vulnerable in our communities waste collection burials and cremations planning and quasi judicial responsibilities and administering financial support, including business grants, the self-employment scheme and welfare rights. In addition, over the course of the response period, officers have ensured that all our five and a half thousand staff and you as elected members can work from home. We've set up childcare hubs across, across the council area and developed digital learning opportunities for all our young people. And Sheena Devlin will give you a further update in a short while about those. We've guaranteed ongoing delivery of health and social care, which now also includes a daily meeting about care homes and Gordon Patterson will pick up some of that in a short while as well. We've also established a welfare communities and volunteer work stream with 7000 contacts undertaken with our residents. Over four and a half thousand shielded people offered support and a thousand food parcels delivered on a regular basis. We've established a food distribution hub and supported all our food banks and food share networks across Perth and Kinross Council. And our staff have also supported a 202% increase in welfare rights activities and overseen a 247% increase in crisis grant expenditure. And Karen Donaldson will give an update um, on the business grant situation as well. In addition, we've implemented 160 pieces of guidance from the Scottish Government in relation to the implementation of the Coronavirus Act 2020. Key areas have included a focus on social care assessment and mental health, care homes, prisoner release into the community, placing request appeals, 
volunteering, adult and child protection, shielding, death registration, implementation of SQA guidance, planning and building control arrangements, funding arrangements for food, welfare and communities, the approach to test, trace, isolate and support, personal protective equipment and public health guidance advice and advice as it has been changing. I would also want to note that the Chief Executive and the Executive Director of Education and Children's Services are both now actively involved in the national education recovery approach to support a return to schools for our young people. Thank you, Chief Executive. OK, thank you, Barbara. Um, can I ask Sheena Devlin if there's anything she would like to update on? Thank you very much, uh, Karen and Barbara. Just by way of um, further update, I would like to outline that um, at the onset, we established a partnership oversight group which included uh, local businesses as well as health, police and other emergency services to oversee the application and allocation um, of places for uh, children of key workers and vulnerable young people at our uh, children's activity centres or hubs. And we've also been working uh, with the recently established Scottish Government brokerage group set up nationally for that purpose as well. We've expanded hub provision as eligibility criteria has expanded and has de demand has increased. From the outset, we um, made direct payments to all families with eligible children for free school meals and have been making those payments direct to people's bank accounts on a fortnightly basis, thus affording them the opportunity of choice um, in terms of where they will purchase food for their families. From the get go, it was important that despite the unusual circumstances that we found ourselves working in, that we found different ways to provide some core essential services, none more so uh, important than in the area of children's services. I'm pleased to say that on a weekly basis, we are seeing at least 90% of the young people on the, the Child Protection Register, and by that I mean actually seeing those young people and maintaining contact by a range of different creative means, whether that's simply telephone conversation through apps, through um, other online platforms as well. And we are ensuring through close joint working between education, children's services, health and third sector staff that those children that, um, and families who need to be seen and be supported are in fact getting that support where we're able to provide it. There's been a range of work underway um, in the background, often unseen from our business resources um, and administration teams, and that has provided a really solid infrastructure for us to be able to deliver our core services. Much of our business, whilst it, you couldn't call it business as usual, it has certainly been business unusual because of the methods of delivery, as opposed to the fact that, that business has stopped. Barbara mentioned that myself and Karen Reid, the Chief Executive, are involved in the, the National C19 Education Recovery Group. That group has met on at least seven occasions in the last couple of weeks, and we expect to hear an announcement later on this week from the First Minister about the, the initial plans for a phased return to formal education and schooling for almost all young people, which is likely to be some point after the, the summer recess. There's nothing else uh, particularly that I want to highlight at this point, so thank you very much for the opportunity to share that information. Thank you, Sheena. Um, can I ask Karen Donaldson to give us an update, please? Good morning. Um, I'd like to give you a brief update on the payment of business grants, um, which has been an important part of the, the Council's contribution to um, getting money out to, to those who need it um, because of um, difficulties during the, the crisis. So the most up-to-date information we have on business grants is that of the 3,641 applications received, we have paid out uh, 2,769 grants 
um, and that's in excess of uh, £30 million pounds that has gone out um, to businesses across Perth and Kinross. The business grants um, scheme um, has continued to evolve over the crisis um, and um, there are changes that are being reflected in the process in our assessment which enable um, more businesses to, to become eligible for payment of the grants. The other, the other stream of funding is in respect of self-employed hardship grants. And as of yesterday, of the 245 applications that have been received, we have paid out on 167 of those and um, grants of £2,000 each. So that's um, £334,000. So um, processing these grants and working with applicants uh, remains a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And lastly, I will bring in Gordon Patterson and then I will open up for elected members questions. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, uh, Council. I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide an update on some of the work that has been undertaken by the Health and Social Care Partnership over the last uh, 12 weeks or so. Uh, I'd firstly want to pay tribute to, to the staff within the partnership and commend them for their commitment, professionalism and flexibility during this the most challenging of times. Um, early on, we initiated a command structure similar to the Council's with gold, silver and bronze command. We produced and have updated a comprehensive mobilisation plan in which we have planned the necessary actions to prepare for the impact of the pandemic to identify new ways of working uh, and to reallocate staff to essential services. Um, to support capacity in the hospital, uh, we have achieved our best ever performance in relation to delayed discharge by introducing seven days, seven day working, uh, um, uh, also introducing um, interim placements for people into care homes and providing wraparound support to the Discharge Hub. There's a number of other actions that uh, members may be interested in, but I'd prefer to spend the next couple of minutes perhaps focusing on an area that has attracted and rightly so significant national attention, and that's around the support to care homes. Um, across Perth and Kinross, the Health and Social Care Partnership, working with the Council and with NHS, working with Scottish Care very closely, have been providing enhanced support to care homes, to the 37 care homes in Perth and Ginross um, from the outset. We have liaised very closely with Scottish Care and with them have delivered weekly Zoom calls to all the care providers um, across Perth and Ginross. We have supported them with the provision of PPE. Um, we have arranged for care home staff and residents to access testing. Uh, and NHS Tayside should perhaps be commended for um, being at the forefront of the delivery of testing for staff and, and for social care staff and, and for residents. Um, and that has been a great support to us. We've ensured that care homes have been able to access um, input from the infection prevention and control team from NHS Tayside and are aware of and are supported to deliver on the government guidance in relation to managing outbreaks and mitigating the impact of COVID. Two weeks ago, the Scottish Government enhanced their monitoring of care homes and we've been working closely with the Director of Public Health and the Care Inspectorate in order to meet uh, the expectations of government. Uh, and at the weekend, the Cabinet Secretary announced that she would like every health board area and partnership to develop a clinical oversight group, further involving the Director of Nursing and the Medical Director from NHS Tayside, as well as the Chief Social Work Officer, uh, the Chief Officer and the Director of Public Health. And we will be initiating daily meetings, virtual meetings, in order to be alerted um, to particular areas where enhanced support uh, may be needed. Uh, I'll stop there and obviously I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much. You're on mute, Karen. 
Thank you, Gordon. Um, can I now open it up, please, to councillors for questions? I know that Councillor Ahern has a question, um, possibly for Sheena, although I am aware Sheena may have some connection issues at the moment, but Jackie Pepper is available to answer. So can I bring in Councillor Ahern, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got a question regarding um, the at-risk and vulnerable children. Uh, Sheena mentioned that we've been able to physically visit 90% of the children that are on the register. And I was just wondering about the other 10, whether they've been contacted um, on the phone or what's happening about the other 10% of the children. OK, thank you. I'll ask Jackie Pepper to answer that. Thank, thank you. I think, um, Councillor Hearn, can you hear me OK? Yes, um, th those statistics are based on a weekly basis. So what that's what that's saying is that um, for those nine, I think it's 91 percent last week. So 91 percent of children in the child protection register last week were seen physically. That doesn't mean to say that those 10 percent weren't seen the week before. So we're, we're certainly uh, and, there, and that there, there wasn't good reasons for not seeing those children. Um, so it's it's our plan is that those children will be seen on a weekly basis, all of those children. So um, it's not that 10% are not being seen at all. So just give you some reassurance around that. And we've also got arrangements in place where the, all children who are uh, um, subject of a multi-agency plan are being seen um, as, as much as up to three times a week in, in, in terms of virtual contact. So the, the, the statistic that um, Sheena quoted there was actually home visits and face to face contact, which is actually quite remarkable in the circumstances. OK, that's very reassuring and it's great to see that we're managing to get in touch with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, can I bring in uh, Councillor McCall, please? Thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you and your team um, for the work you've done during this uh, crisis. It's been quite remarkable. I would agree with you on that and very commendable. And equally to Gordon and the Health and Social Care Partnership team, I think it's been astounding what you've done. So I want to thank you myself. Um, my question actually is for Gordon and it's relating to adults um, who live independently but receive care at home, either through a partner provider of uh, the council or through uh, self-directed support. I'm particularly concerned about adults who live on their own with learning disabilities or adults with dementia. And I'm wondering how many adults have been contacted directly by social work um, to make sure that A, they understand what is happening and also to make sure that any arrangements that are in place for them is still adequate under this lockdown scenario. Thank you, Councillor McCall. Um, I don't have details of the numbers of people who've been contacted. One of the challenges that we had from the outset was that we did uh, significantly anticipate a surge uh, of demand in relation to COVID and that required us to review um, the care packages that we were providing. Um, that, that also coincided with, um, with uh, the lockdown. So what we had was a number of families who would otherwise have been at work um, who were keen to pr provide support to their loved ones uh, and who were happy for the time being to relinquish um, the level of support that they would otherwise have received from the Health and Social Care Partnership. I have to say we also had some families who were themselves uh, concerned about the potential of a number of visitors coming in to provide care and support uh, and because they were available to provide support uh, that was um, able to relieve some of the pressures that might otherwise have been experienced by our social care services, uh, including those that we commissioned from the independent sector. However, I think it's fair to say that it was probably at that time not expected that 10 weeks on we would still be in the same position. So what we have been doing is reinstating packages and contacting families because we're recognising that, that care, uh, support to carers is essential and inevitably a number of those will be feeling the pressure. Uh, and, and will also potentially be returning to work in the, in the coming weeks. In terms of people who live alone, their care packages have continued. We have risk assessed everyone. We've engaged with people who are supported to ensure that they are continuing to receive the support that they need. 
we've been and would be keen to respond to any uh, challenges in relation to people who are perhaps feeling that they need a, a bit more support and, and happy to receive representations in that regard. But also to recognise a number of these people are also being included within the shielding group. So these are people who will be also being provided with support uh, from the council in terms of contact, food parcels um, and uh, a recognition of their vulnerability. So I think because um, the COVID surge um, didn't arrive to the extent that we expected, but we're now expecting to be involved in supporting people for longer, um, we are now looking at how we can remobilise and, and redeploy staff in a way that enables us to adjust our service offer to what is being widely described as as the new normal. And this will be important in terms of determining how we can best support people whilst um, recognising their isolation and also recognising some of the challenges around the lockdown and uh, social distancing. May I ask a supplementary? Yeah, of course. of course. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, for that answer, that very comprehensive answer. Um, and I'm pleased that that work has been done. I will be interested in the numbers, though, because I do know of, of some individuals who neither they nor their family have been contacted directly by their name social worker in this regard. So um, I'm happy to follow up with, with you offline about that. Um, mm -hmm. But I am concerned, not just, you know, particularly for people with dementia, whose level of understanding may be quite low, and people with learning disabilities are in the same category. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor McCall and Gordon. If you can speak with Councillor McCall offline, that would be very helpful. And can I also say thank you, Councillor McCall, for your kind words at the beginning of your question. They are appreciated by both myself and indeed colleagues. Can I now turn to Councillor Forbes, please? Thank you, Karen. Question on uh, the business grants that we've been distributing on behalf of the government. Do we have the full amount of money now in Perth and Kinross to meet our obligations and given what was said just a minute ago do we are we now going back to look again at some of the grants that we previously refused? Okay so um, that's quite an easy question so I'll answer that one. Um, we have received £36 million at this moment in time from Scottish Government for business grant funding. Our total allocation is £45 million, so we have sufficed funding um, at the time being. In terms of those uh, applications that were initially rejected, we have a quality assurance process in place and we will be looking at all of those applications again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will bring in now Councillor Ros McCall. My apologies, I, I was slightly premature with my queue, um, so I'll be coming back in later. I did delete it, but um, it obviously has come up on your screen, Karen, so my apologies, I'll be coming back in later. OK, thank you. In that case, I will now move to Councillor Jarvis, please. My, my questions on business support. Uh, it's a difficult area because there are so many different types of businesses, employment. Are we confident we're actually reaching as many people we can? And have we identified an area who just fall between all the holes and just find it very difficult to get any support at all? OK, thank you, Councillor Jarvis. I will ask uh, David Littlejohn to respond to your question, please. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Yes, the, the, the government schemes um, cover a large number of businesses, but unfortunately not everyone. Um, I think those businesses that um, are not eligible for any of the, the, the grant assistance directly from the, 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 the Small Business Support Fund are those occupying premises with a, a rateable value, effectively above £51,000. Um, the, the government support is targeted at um, smaller businesses and they've used rateable value as the proxy for that. So we are aware of a number of businesses above that threshold who, who can't apply for the grant. Now, what we're doing is encouraging people to, you know, to contact us so we can kind of direct them to other sources of funding. You might be aware we produce, uh, it was initially weekly, it's now twice weekly business bulletin. 
which is actually being picked up by thousands of businesses actually outside Perth and Kinross as well. And that's a really good update of all the support that's available to all businesses. As, as more and more schemes have been introduced, it is quite a complex picture. So, you know, my staff and those of our partner staff, we're all working together, are there to support businesses who have particular queries, um, but certainly in terms of, of grant funding, it is restricted um, to a large number of businesses, but clearly not everybody, uh, every business who's affected. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, there's, you, you mentioned a uh, reasonable value of over 51,000. I mean, there's a lot of very small businesses work in very small places and I mean are they covered are they somebody that's falling through the net uh, yes the, the most of the assistance uh, the, the figure that you know the 13 and a half 13.5 million that has been issued so far has gone to to businesses um who are occupying premises with a rateable value of, of less than eighteen thousand pounds and in receipt of the small business bonus in other words they're not actually paying any rates, they're, they're eligible to pay rates, but they're not paying it, then that picks up everybody right down to you know, a rateable value of, of, of a pound. So anybody who's on the rates register is uh, with a, a rateable value of less than £18,000 absolutely has received um, £10,000 unless they're in a sector um, that's simply not eligible. There are um, people with yards where there's no obvious economic activity, for example, um, so they've not been eligible. but. As the chief executive mentioned, we're working through all of the um, businesses that we weren't able to assist the first time round because they weren't apparently eligible as the eligibility criteria have changed. And as we're clearer on what is and isn't eligible, we've gone back through every single one of those. And the local rates team are absolutely doing as much as they can. Our starting point is if we can pay the money, we will pay the money. Um, so we've given that that, that commitment out, out there to our, our business community. Right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Can I move to Councillor Wilson, please? Thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, two questions for uh, Gordon. First one is, how much use have we made of Beach Grove House in, in the pandemic situation um, as a step down facility? And, and secondly, Many care homes have attracted a lot of adverse publicity, but many others have attracted no publicity at all because they've they've been doing really well. Um, what what opportunities are we taking, or will we take, to learn from the ones that have have managed to contain the the infection rate, or in fact almost eliminate it? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, in relation to Beach Grove, Patrick, we... could you open the? Sorry, um, in relation could to Beach Grove, we, we... kitchen window. <laughs> Councillor McCall, I think your um, microphone's on and your kitchen window's closed. Um, so, in relation to Beach Grove, we brought on that additional capacity, Councillor Wilson, in anticipation that we may need it. it the reality has been that we haven't needed it. We had redeployed staff and it, it was prepped and available in order to step people down from uh, hospital. Uh, we were very clear from the outset that that would only be people who were not COVID positive and we would be screening and managing that situation. It remains available to us, it, it is prepped and ready should we be uh, experiencing a surge um, in future, um, but to date uh, we haven't had to use it. In relation to your wider question, I think um, it's, it's a very valid point that we need to reflect on those care homes who have managed to contain uh, the situation or who have not experienced uh, an outbreak to the same extent as, as some who have been featured in the media. Now, that may well be down to um, effective infection prevention control measures. It may well be down to PPE but it may well be down to disease progression and, and they may yet experience that. So we need to make sure that we're not at all complacent because while um, the demand on acute hospital services uh, has plateaued, we need to recognise that COVID is still, we're not fighting a phony war here in, in care homes and care at home and in community services, COVID is significantly impacting on people's lives, their families and their communities. Um, so what we're doing is working very closely with all care homes um, and 
particularly in relation to, as you've described, the need to um, always focus on infection prevention um, and then respond positively and swiftly whenever there is a, a diagnosed case, which, as I say, has been greatly aided by NHS Tayside's testing policy here. Thank you, Gordon. Thank Councillor you. Wilson, thank you. Um, can I move to Councillor James, please? Thanks very much, Karen. Um, probably quite an easy one, um, and it's aimed uh, at um, Sheena, Sheena Devlin. Um, I, I mean, it's kids have been off school for a couple of months, and I noticed that um, Sheena said we're looking to phase return uh, for the kids at school, and obviously all the precautions will be taken uh, as you've done so well uh, up to now. My question really is, will or are we planning to have a summer recess still or summer holidays for the kids, or are we planning to, to forgo that to catch up on an education? Thank you very much, uh, Councillor James. You'll appreciate that this is a, um, a very live issue <clears throat> and one that um, all local authorities in Scotland have been considering and beginning to plan for recognising, of course, that all of our local uh, delivery plans will be based on the national advice that we receive from Scottish government in terms of public health advice, scientific advice, and using all of that will guide uh, what we're uh, able to do that's in the interests of children and young people and their families. And a key thing is understanding that when youngsters come back to school, that they have in the main, a, a number of them been participating in some aspects of home learning, but that will look and feel different for, for a number of young children for, for very good reasons, because home learning should not and cannot replicate in school learning. They're quite different. And so it will be incumbent on the staff in schools at the point that children do return to understand where they are and to really focus in those first few weeks and perhaps beyond on what we're calling a, a recovery curriculum. So really focusing on ensuring that staff and children and young people have their, their mental health and well-being as the prime consideration in any learning that, that is planned for and that we build incrementally on that. And that might mean for a, a short time that there's a relatively narrow curriculum that expands into other areas. But what we certainly don't want are children and young people coming back feeling like I'm way behind, I've missed out and I'm the only one because this will have affected all children. You ask about summer provision and that's something that uh, will be um, a, a, an act, it's an active and live consideration for all of us just now. What we do know is that we will continue to provide child care over the summer period, just as we did over the Easter holiday period and on all the bank holidays and indeed at weekends for those who are eligible for that child care provision. But what we would want to do is understand as young people are coming back into school where they are and what an appropriately bespoke curriculum would look like for those. So it's not just as straightforward as, as saying that there's not going to be a summer recess and there, there's quite a, a complicated set of circumstances around making such a decision. However, what we have been doing not just in Perth and Kinross, but across uh, Scotland, is recognising that there are probably some children and young people more adversely affected by not having been at school for some time. And we have been working with those children. We'll continue to do that through the rest of May and into June to provide some direct support in some of our schools and other buildings for those young people and for young people who would be um, naturally coming to a significant transition point. So youngsters who will be leaving nursery school and coming into primary and those who would be leaving primary and moving into secondary. It is our um, intention and our ambition to be providing some kind of 
transition experience for those young people to close off that which has gone before and to begin an introduction to that which is coming. We will be required to produce a, a local delivery plan based on this, the uh, national guidance that I explained and it would be my intention that I bring that plan to um, the meeting of Council in June and more of the detail and information that people are, are quite understandably looking to, to uh, find out more about just now will be included at that point and we'll keep you update between now and then as to, to what will actually happen and what that will look like in Perth and Kinross. What's really important is that in terms of our local delivery plan, as you know, we have um, a, a varied school estate in terms of school size, and I mean that in terms of the role of schools, number of children who attend a school, and also the size of buildings. And so there won't be a one size fits all model in that it will look exactly the same, but what will be the same will be the principles under which we plan for that phased return in due course. Thank you, Sheena. Councillor James, are you happy with that response? Very happy with that response. Good. Thanks, Karen. That's uh, very thorough. Thank you, Sheena. Good. Thank you, Sheena. Can I move to Councillor Barrett, please? Um, thank you, uh, Chief Executive. Um, just before asking my question, I, I wanted uh, to commend and express my appreciation um, and thanks to uh, the community's team uh, within the, 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 the council. I think that the work that they've done um, to support community food initiatives across Perth and Kinross has been um, tremendous. Um, locally, I'm thinking about things like the, the give or take boxes um, in, in Muirton, um, the Perth and Kinross Food Bank, where their council is providing both administrative uh, backup and support, um, as well as the presence of the community uh, wardens there to do deliveries and, and, and manage uh, queues and demand. It's really, really helpful. Um, and um, also uh, providing the shop on the Dunkel Road for the uh, Muirton Community Food Share uh, uh, initiative is, is really good. Uh, and, and that doesn't um, cover the, the, the support that's been provided um, to other groups all across Perth and Ken Ross. Uh, and I'll, I'll let other members uh, come in on, on, on that. Um, I had two questions, um, one on, on education. Um, is the um, accommodation uh, at Bertha Park being considered to be utilised um, given the, 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 the needs that there will be for uh, smaller class sizes? Um, and I expect a, a, a pressures on um, availability of rooms and facilities within the rest of the school estate. Uh, that was my first question. Will I leave you to respond to that before I ask my second? OK, Councillor Barrett, thank you very much. The, the reality is that we are doing um, uh, currently engaged with every head teacher looking at each individual premise and also what the totality of um, accommodation might be across a local management group, for example, or across a, a sector, because there are different ways to cut this. Um, and, and it may be that we find children from primary in some secondary buildings, and it may be that we find children from some secondaries in other buildings. But that's a level of detail that we haven't got to yet. What we're currently looking at are physical capacities of every single classroom in every single school and the physical capacity of circulation space and communal areas such as gym halls, dining halls, and what that actually offers us in terms of adhering to the public health advice and the scientific advice that we will be given by the government. So that work is at a relatively early stage, but head teachers have been considering that and we will be looking to see if we if we work from <clears throat> the, the, the premise of we would want to seek to have as many children as possible in school as often as possible and as safely <clears throat> as possible. That's the starting point. And if that means different and creative use of the school estate and other um, buildings across the built estate in Perth and Kinross, then that's what we'll do. Um, thanks for that, Sheena. That's kind of exactly the response I was hoping to, to receive. So um, thank you for that. Um, my second question um, was uh, with regard to um, economic recovery and support for people who are inevitably going to uh, lose their jobs. We had the announcement yesterday um, of the impending redundancies um, at OVO um, SSE, which could have a, a significant impact on uh, people in, in, in Perth and Perth and Kinross. Um, 
We've had some really you know, excellent work uh, done by the uh, welfare rights team supporting people already affected by the, by, by the coronavirus crisis, um, but there's going to be a serious need to significantly scale up uh, and work in partnership with um, other, other agencies um, in order to support people uh, who lose their jobs. Uh, can I ask you know, what is the council doing to set that in place now? Councillor Barrett, if I can respond to that, please. We will be discussing in private session today the recovery and renewal plans for the Council. We do recognise that we've seen over 200% increase in terms of welfare rights, um, payments and about 247% increase in the expenditure paid out. So we will cover that point in more detail this afternoon or sorry, later this morning. What I can tell elected members is that we are very much aware of the impact that COVID-19 is having across our communities, both in terms of the job losses that are being announced. Indeed, um, yesterday, as well as the very um, sad news about OVO and SSE Energy deploying a voluntary redundancy scheme, we were also made aware of the unemployment statistics. And what I can confirm to elected members is that um, we are um, aware that in Perth and Kinross we have seen a 94% increase in unemployment in one month during April. So we've gone from 2% unemployment, which was the seventh lowest in Scotland, to 3.9% uh, in a very short period of time. So clearly our focus must be on um, economic recovery and how we best support the most vulnerable in our society. We cannot do that on our own and we needed to build on the amazing work, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning of your question, that's happening across our communities, but we must work with our partners in the Community Planning Partnership to maximise the approach that we have. So thank you for your question, and I hope we'll be able to get into more discussion later. Thank you. Can I now move to Councillor Pover, please? Councillor Pover. Councillor Pover, I think your microphone is muted. And I think you're still muted. If you could just take your microphone. That's you. On you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Chief Executive. My question is for Sheena Devlin, and uh, I just wondered how the Out of Hours Service has coped um, with the coronavirus, coronavirus um, crisis and how staff have managed um, to go out to situations they might not be aware of and they, they might not have any background information on. I'm just wondering how that situation's um, been, how they've coped with that. Thank you, and thank you for asking that particular question, Councillor Pover. Um, I, I'll, I'll kick off and I'll also invite Jackie Pepper to say something about that as well, if, if I may. I think I said um, in, in my, my brief remarks at the beginning of this session that from the get go, we recognised that there were uh, services that remained core and essential and that we would continue to deliver those and it would be the how those were delivered would, would be the, the different aspect. And one of the, the very early bits of work that was undertaken was a review of our staff and our staff teams to, to understand if their working patterns needed to change so that we were providing um, perhaps smaller teams working for shorter periods of time, but on a different rotation basis to make sure that, that no one particular team was, was overwhelmed if, if indeed that, that, that should materialise. What we did see was not a significant drop off nor rise in, in the first couple of weeks of calls coming in uh, to the duty team. And at no point over the last eight weeks have we been at the point where the duty team have not been able to respond in an appropriate way to the, the, the calls that have been coming in. We, we have seen um, pretty what we would consider usual calls being made, 
but I would say that in the past couple of weeks, particularly, we've seen a slight rise in that. You can definitely see the impact of lockdown um, manifesting itself across the piece uh, and with, with children and families as well. So we, we haven't been overwhelmed. We haven't had the levels of staff absence that um, we'd done some initial modelling in, in case that materialised and that hasn't materialised. And therefore, we have been able to, to respond appropriately and with our partners in police and health and third sector as well to the, the, the calls that have been coming in through duty. And I'll ask Jackie if she's got any more specific information that she would be able to provide by way of response to your question. Thank you very much, Councillor Pover, for your question. Um, just really, I think Sheena has given a very comprehensive uh, answer to that, but I know that um, you have a particular interest in uh, mental health officer availability um, from previous uh, discussions that we've had, and really just to give you some reassurance to all elected members that the uh, planning for worst case scenario in relation to um, staffing um, has taken into consideration the availability of qualified mental health officers, staff to carry out adult support and protection and child protection uh, inquiries and investigations. And that has remained positive throughout and uh, is sitting at a, a position where, where it's more than satisfactory at this point in time. We've also uh, put in place a, a management rota for the out of hours service, which uh, covers uh, social work staff and social work uh, senior managers across um, uh, education, children's services, criminal justice and the health and social care partnership. So in terms of out of hours provision, um, the, the, the position has been uh, very satisfactory. That's, that's excellent. Thanks very much for that, Jackie. And Councillor Pover, if I can just add to what Sheena and Jackie have shared in terms of out of hours, one of the other things that we've done is we've increased the regularity in which the Chief Officers Group meets. We're now meeting every third week and we have a much closer scrutiny role along with our partners honing in on risk, vulnerability and public protection. So I hope that gives both yourself and other elected members the assurance that you're seeking. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you, Chief Executive. Can I now bring in Councillor Bailey, please? Hi everyone, um, thank you um, and um, thank you for the updates and thank you Gordon for the update regarding delayed discharge performance. Um, I wondered Gordon if you could let us know please um, how many people were discharged to care homes without a confirmed COVID negative status in the period since the 1st of March and then additionally on what date did COVID negative status become a required criteria for discharge to any care home in the area? Um, I heard that you mentioned that for Beach Grove specifically, it was always the case, but the question is more general and probably predates the point at which we were ready at Beach Grove. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey, for your question. I have to say that I don't have the details to hand. Certainly um, over the last three weeks, perhaps, it has been um, a matter of national guidance that no one would be discharged to a care home without two negative tests having been confirmed. Um, in relation to who may have moved before then, I will probably need to provide you with that information offline if that's OK, in terms of um, the, the movement in relation to the challenges that are delayed discharge. Thank you. I look forward to that follow up, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And can I now move to Councillor Lane, please? Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Chief Executive. Uh, uh, two questions that are sort of related, um, probably for Gordon. Um, I would imagine that uh, moving forward, care homes are uh, going to uh, struggle to attract new residents and uh, obviously they, ne they need to be reasonably full to be viable. Um, I was wondering, um, across the, the country we could be looking at uh, failing uh, financially care homes um, and I'm wondering if uh, what we as a council what our position will be doing uh, with us you know to look for to to mitigate this and have we put plans in place already for that and the other thing uh, probably for you chief executive is um, would 
the council, the, the community and everybody has dealt very well with the, the, the current situation. Um, but now I would, if you could just broadly set out what your plans or what you see, your vision is to see as we move into the next phase and come out of this um, and, and, and what, what you see our role uh, as elected members moving forward as well, please. Thank you. So if I take your first question, Councillor Lane, thank you for that. Um, obviously, there are and will be continuing challenges for care homes around how they respond to the demands of COVID-19, uh, and that includes in relation to their um, viability moving forward. More broadly, the Scottish Government has required every health and social care partnership to submit a mobilisation plan uh, and included within that a financial appendix that identifies the additional costs that have been borne in relation to our response to COVID-19. That extends to the provision of support to um, the independent care sector, um, be that in relation to um, providing uh, them with funding to meet the costs around PPE, around additional staffing, around use of agency staff. So we have a substantive amount within our mobilisation plan that would be used to provide support to care at home and care home providers in order to try to mitigate the impact of um, COVID-19. You're right too, though, to highlight the fact that their um, viability can be critically linked to levels of occupancy. And we do have seven care homes currently who are closed to new admissions. Um, three of those are um, receiving testing visits this week in order to see whether or not they can move to a position where they may reopen to new admissions. Ten other homes who, that were closed have since reopened, so we're seeing some progress there. Um, and what we're doing is looking at, because of the, the provision that's built in to provide two um, negative tests, maintaining occupancy, maintaining opportunities for people who require that level of support to move into care homes. And obviously the work that we're doing with public health seeks to ensure that the environments that people are moving into um, have experienced um, testing and, and, and full infection and prevention and control measures. So the, the position is, is fairly fluid as some care homes are having to close and sometimes because of precautionary measures, um, others are, are reopening. We have arrangements in place to provide supplementary staffing to care homes, um, including from the NHS, should that be needed. And again, the costs would be borne by our mobilisation plan uh, and uh, seeking a reimbursement from the Scottish Government in that regard. Gordon, thank you. Can I ask you just to address the point in terms of have mobilisation funds reached the council and partnership? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the mobilisation plans have now been submitted twice to government. Um, they're recognised as an iterative document. The next version has to be received on Monday next. Um, these reflect uh, the position as it evolves. And as I said earlier, I think a recognition now that we are not having come into COVID, we are not going to come out of COVID quite as quickly. This is turning into more of a marathon perhaps than, than a sprint. And we're having to look at how we, we will live with COVID for the foreseeable. And it's recognised the mobilisation plans and the additional costs will um, require to be considered by government moving forward. To date, we've received £1.383 million in relation to our um, outgoings um, as a, a, an, an initial payment because the government secured 55 million, I think, in consequentials and dispersed that um, out to the partnerships and the councils through uh, the normal NRAC and GAE routes. So we've seen some money coming through and we're in uh, continuing discussions with the government in relation to what additional expenditure is being incurred. Gordon, thank you. Councillor Lane, can I address your second point about how we move um, through this crisis? So you will appreciate that initially what we had to look at was our immediate uh, crisis response. So we have been in a response phase to the pandemic. We now move into recovery and the transition phase 
to um, move on from the pandemic. And the final phase is how we actually look at renewal and what our new normal is going to be. You will um, enjoy, I hope, a presentation shortly from um, the Bronze Command Group that has been working on uh, response, recovery and renewal over recent weeks and we'll be able to take you through in more detail our suggested uh, approach. You asked specifically about the role of elected members and I think it's really important to say a few things around that. Firstly, the circumstances we find ourselves in, as we, many people have used this word, are unprecedented. We as an executive and senior officers want to get back to democratic decision making at the earliest opportunity and indeed the next item on the agenda I will take elected members through how we will do that. But one of my proposals and we can come back to this in due course is that I would like to see a member officer working group to work together with officers in the bronze command and the executive to take forward our response recovery and renewal plan so I hope that answers your question. Thank you yes thanks and thanks Gordon. Okay can I now move on to Councillor Anderson please. Councillor Anderson. Perhaps we could have his parrot to talk. So as we wait for Councillor Anderson, I'll move to Councillor Duff and I'll try to come back to Councillor Anderson in a few moments. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. I have two questions. I'll take them separately, if that's OK. Um, elsewhere in the papers, it talks about there being 4,340 uh, residents on the shielding category. And I think as of 4th of May 2860, these had been contacted by the Council. I just wondered if uh, any further progress had made, been made in reaching out to these vulnerable residents. Thank you, Councillor Duff. I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Simpson and Fiona Robertson, if available, to come in and respond to your question. And before I do that, I just want to make clear that many senior officers have been retasked and redeployed. Councillor Barrett spoke about the importance of the community's team, and I'm really delighted that we've had such support from Lisa, Fiona, and indeed Stephen Crawford to take forward this vital work. So, Lisa or Fiona, if you're able to respond to Councillor Duff's question, please. Morning, everyone. Um, yes, we've we've clearly lettered everybody on the shielding list and have made several phone calls with our housing colleagues. There have been about 8,000 contacts made with um, tenants um, who may fall within that category of vulnerable. Right from the very beginning, we took the view that whilst we have uh, particular obligations around those in the shielding category, our, um, our approach was to basically provide assistance and support by way of food supply, medical supply, contact um, and welfare checks to all of those that, that anybody that needed help and anybody that needed support. Um, over the, the past few weeks, we have um, had contacts directly between, between email and telephone conversation with in excess of 7,000 people. Um, the housing team have done similar with, with uh, uh, up to 7,000 of their own tenants. Um, we're sharing information. We're getting feedback from community groups where they have concerns about people and these are being followed up. We are carrying out face to face welfare checks with those that we are deemed most vulnerable and most in need. Um, and that really good network of support and sharing of intelligence across the piece with all of the agencies, the third sector, our community groups and our, our uh, other services. Um, and we, we also have sent out leaflets to every um, household. There was 70,000 leaflets printed of which our volunteers uh, did a, a great job in distributing. So our numbers are well known. We have a dedicated helpline that's well known and publicised. And I think the fact that most people are contacting the council directly as opposed to having to feel 
that they need to go through the national helpline is also reflective of the fact that our communities know where that help is available and that they are using um, the opportunity to reach out and contact us for help and support, which we are responding to in all cases. Thank you. I'll go on to my second question, uh, Chief Executive, if I may then. Um, in terms of the appeals, uh, sorry, the business grants, uh, Mrs. Donson talk about, talked about um, a review being made of those that hadn't been sought to be eligible for the for the grant. But I have read about uh, an appeals process and I wondered if um, there was something formal in terms of an appeals process that was going to come along as well. Can I ask uh, Cam Donaldson or David Littlejohn to respond, please? Um, I'm happy to, to start off. Um, we have two, two stages. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the guidance has changed um, significantly over the course of the, the, the crisis. So the first uh, port of call is to review all of the applications that were initially rejected to make sure they can now be approved because of the changes in the guidance. And that's um, removed uh, or, or allowed the, the grant to be uh, awarded to significantly more numbers of businesses that otherwise would have uh, not received the grant. The second stage is in a formal appeals proce if process. If those businesses believe that we have made an error or we've misinterpreted information they've provided or they think we've made a, a mistake in determining um, their rateable description or the assessor has made a mistake, then they've got the opportunity to write in formally and that will be reviewed initially by the um, the local taxes team to see if it can be resolved easily. If not, it will be referred on to myself, Stuart McKenzie and Alan Taylor um, to, to, to look through and see if we can find a way to uh, to support that appeal or, 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 or not. So that's the process that we've um, put in place. I need to say that to, to date, the vast majority of businesses that have contacted us initially having been rejected have subsequently been able to have their grant awarded because it's been a um, it's been a tweaking of the of the guidance or a reinterpretation of the guidance. So, as I said earlier, we'll do absolutely everything we can to, to make sure that it's only in the very, very rare circumstance where the business feel they, they had to appeal um, because they really they couldn't support our, our, our view. But that's the process we've now got in place. OK, thank you. Thank you, David. Can I now move to Councillor Anderson, please? Uh, can you hear me this time? Yes, we can. Yes, for, for some reason it wouldn't un, unmute, but we've got, we've got it fixed, thanks to the techie guys. Um, firstly, I would like to um, um, thank all the officers and uh, the various um, departments for working um, so well through this pandemic. And I have no complaints whatsoever. Um, I have had the uh, questions and uh, concerns answered very quickly. However, I've got two questions. Uh, the first one is concerning uh, those that don't pay rates, uh, but uh, have businesses working from home. Um, uh, I take it that the only support they will get is through self-employment um, assistance, or is there any other um, th uh, um, form of support that uh, they can get. Um, and then secondly, my other questions about something different, so I'll maybe get an answer on that one first. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Anderson, and thank you for your kind words. I'll ask David Littlejohn to respond, please. Thanks for the question, Councillor Anderson. You're absolutely right. The the, the main grant scheme um, is, is based on the, on the premise, or literally based on premises, um, so for people working at home, they're not eligible for the £10,000 or the £25,000 grant. So if they're self-employed, there is the, the there are two schemes effectively available. Um, if they have submitted a tax return prior to um, the middle of April, so a tax return for the 18-19 the year, um, and that was submitted by the middle of April, they're eligible for the HMRC self-employment funding. Um, and that's paying a proportion of their um, average um, income over the past few years based on their tax returns. For businesses that were newly starting up, those that have started trading since 
um, the 1st of April last year, 2019, and 5th of April 2019, they can apply to the Council for the Self-Employment Hardship Grant um, if they can evidence that in fact they have only just commenced trading and therefore they haven't yet submitted or been able to submit a tax return and they can get a one-off £2,000 hardship grant. Again, there will be a number of people who are self-employed who for whatever reason have chosen not to make a tax return and again that is a group of, of individuals where it becomes very difficult to, to assist unless, as I said, they've just recently started up in business. There will always be people that fall through the cracks. What we're trying to do is identify who they are and see what else, what other support we can, we can, we can offer them as best we can. Thank Hope you that so answers much the question. That. Yeah, thank you so much. That gives clarity if I have people. Uh, as you know, I come from the, the self-employed, though I'm now a councillor part-time and part-time self-employed and though I am quite comfortable off, I'm sure there's other ex-colleagues of mine that might be feeling it uh, a bit hard at the moment. My second question is probably to Jackie Pepper, but uh, maybe be wrong. Uh, for TV, it, um, it had a status uh, of a centre um, and it was used when Butterson was closed. I don't know if it's further utilised, but um, with the social distancing and required for classrooms, uh, would uh, for TV be, con be cons reconsidered for education? Councillor Anderson, as I as I said when I was uh, responding to Councillor James' question and I think Councillor Parrott's question, what we are currently doing is looking at the entirety of the built estate. Um, which would include all schools currently used as schools, but other buildings as well. And that may include halls, um, you know, be they church halls or, or local halls. And until each um, head teacher has been able to undertake the, the detailed piece of work in relation to their own particular building, what we currently don't know at this stage is what other buildings we may need to, to bring into operation as well. So I think the, the answer to your question is that nothing will, um, that there will be nothing that we won't consider as appropriate and, and factor that into the, the uh, recovery planning for education. Uh, thank you so much for that because uh, for TV it now isn't a school and isn't a class as a hall or a, I thought I would get some clarity on that, but uh, thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Sheena. Can I now move to Councillor Purvis, please? Thank you, Chief Executive. Um, I have three uh, separate questions, if that's okay. Uh, one on health and social care, one on business support, and one on uh, schools. The first one, just following on from a previous question to um, the Chief Officer of the Health and Social Care Partnership on the um, £50 million pounds uh, of uh, social care money that is inexplicably being um, routed through uh, health boards, despite the fact that health boards don't have uh, responsibility for social care. Um, it was mentioned there that this funding is going to be allocated on the basis of the, the NRAC formula, obviously the main driver for which is inequality. Um, we, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, those who are less well off are more affected by the virus, but we know that the primary driver for people um, being worse off uh, from the virus or having uh, worse effects is age. Um, we have previously argued in the case of GP prescribing that money should be allocated on the basis of age rather than on the basis of the NRAC formula. Obviously, that would mean that Perth and Kinross would get more money out of this allocation than it would um, unless if it were uh, done as is being suggested under the NRAC formula. I'm wondering if that point has been made um, whether that decision is final uh, and can we possibly um, look to change that or if not in this instance, certainly going forward, if there are any further allocations of funding on this basis. Thank you, Councillor Purvis. That, that's uh, a really helpful question and I think um, shows, um, highlights some of the challenges that, that we need to we need to try to address. I, I, I would have preferred also that the allocation of funding was not dispersed on the basis of, of that calculation, but rather met uh, and responded to our actual spend and the actual commitments that we have incurred. However, um, that may present a challenge moving forward. I don't think that the representation that you've highlighted has in fact been made, 
We've certainly made it in the context, as you've said, in relation to the allocation of prescribing funding. Um, and certainly we can do so and will do so uh, on the basis of the advice that you've offered. So I'm happy to take that forward. Thank you, Chief Officer. I think that would be um, really helpful if that could be done going forward. And um, the second question, per perhaps for the Head of Planning and Economic Development, um, is on business um, support. Um, there have been suggestions that there might be various loopholes and, and some of those have been tried to, uh, people have tried to address. Um, one has been if people are sharing premises um, and they are not the named rate payer um, on the, the, the premises that they are using. Um, so they are not then eligible for um, the business support grants that others have been given, um, but uh, they're not necessarily getting um, their rents reduced uh, because of the grants that perhaps those who own the premises are available, are available to them. Um, so I suppose the question is the UK government have, um, I think earlier in May, announced additional support for um, people who are in this situation. I'm not sure that the Scottish Government has made um, a similar offer at the moment. I'm just wondering whether we were aware of any uh, people in Perth and Kinross who might have encountered this issue and if possible whether we could make representation to the Scottish Government on this if we have not already done so. Thank you Councillor Purvis, that's a, a, you know, a really good question. It is a point that has been raised. Um, I'm aware of a number of businesses, but there's a small number who have approached us to say that um, they, they, they rent and from from premises. It's the landlord that's paying the rates, not the business or or they share um, and the other the other party is, is the rate payer. There's two two points, I guess I would want to say in answer. Firstly, we are aware this is an issue and it has been raised with the Scottish Government as discussed regularly. And you're correct that, that, that no decision has been uh, made yet on that factor. Um, but absolutely, you're, you're, you're right. It is an issue in a small number of cases. The, the second response is what we're encouraging those businesses to do is speak immediately to the Tayside assessor and see if something can be done by their making both parties the rate payer or some reasonable discussion with their landlord, who is the ratepayer, in terms of sharing that, that grant. Now, I'm aware that in many cases of that small number, the landlord has reasonably accepted that the, the, the tenant is, is actually entitled to, to, to some of that, that funding and support, but that's a voluntary arrangement. It's not entirely satisfactory, and we have made fairly strong representations directly with civil servants, and I know that it has come up certainly in conversations I've had with, with, with MSPs. So um, thank you for that question. Thank you. That's, that's really reassuring that uh, those representations have been made and, and, and let's hope that perhaps something comes uh, of that. The last question was on um, exams. I'm not sure if this is within the scope of the, the groups, the national groups that the um, Executive Director of Education and Children's Service and the Chief Executive are on, but, but regardless, it would be useful uh, for some additional clarity on that. I know that we previously had some rather ambiguous statements from the Scottish Government um, on how exam grades will be calculated, something along the lines of predicted grades moderated by statistics. I know that in the rest of the UK we've had really clear guidance about how um, these decisions will be taken and the fact that um, if people are not happy with the grades that they receive as part of this process, that they will then have the opportunity to reset that exam to try and get the grade that they um, think that they deserve. I'm just wondering whether there has been any further clarity from the Scottish Government on this issue, um, and if not, whether we have been involved in discussions or made representations um, on trying to get further details, because I know that it's something that um, is uh, causing some anxiety um, among um, pupils who would have been uh, doing their exams at this time. Thank you, Councillor Purvis. In relation to, um, I'll pick up on the various points that you've raised, and if I omit any, please just remind me. In terms of uh, ongoing discussion with SQA and Scottish Government, yes, we are involved directly in the, the national work stream that has been established around that and have good representation from within education services who attend those, um, their now weekly meetings. We have been following all of the SQA guidance, of which there has been quite a bit actually been coming out and that has been shared with our education services team and considered and shared with uh, all of our 
uh, secondary head teachers. And what we have established in Perth and Kinross is a uh, a set of five criteria, and this is broadly similar to approaches being taken in other local authorities, so that there's clarity about the expectation. I feel like it's five key performance indicators that, that we are giving to all of our secondary departments as they engage in the process of um, looking at the, the gradings and the estimates of young people's work. So there's certain criteria that it, that it has to meet and that will be consistent across all Perth and Kinross schools. You ask about the ability to actually reset an exam. I'm assuming that you're, you're referring to situation in England and other places where that, that provision is there. What there is in fact is an appeals um, process that is being put in place for, uh, child, uh, for young people in Scotland who can appeal their final um, awarded grade when they receive it in August. As far as I'm aware, there is not the facility um, being made available to actually sit an exam as an appeals process based on the estimated grade. But all of that information, um, as I say, is being shaped and formed by head teachers and other officers in education and children's services and communicated uh, to schools, discussed in schools and that information I can see from schools own um, social media accounts is being shared regularly with, with parents and with uh, children and young people as well. Does that cover all points of your the questions that you asked? Thank you very much for, for that response. That's that's really helpful. I think specifically, um, and that's useful to know that there is an appeals process in England. I think there is an appeals process, but there is also then the opportunity for people to um, to sit that exam should they not be happy with the outcome of that appeal. That was my understanding. Um, I'm just wondering whether it's possible for us to suggest that um, as a council. I know that there are quite a number of people who um, maybe don't think that, that coursework and other things, even if it's all taken holistically, might reflect um, what they think they should have got should they have um, taken the exam at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware that there is um I will double check, but I'm, I've not been aware that there is any facility being provided um, to, to sit an exam. I would think if that's not the case, which I, I don't think it is Councillor Purvis, then it's probably, uh, we're probably beyond the point of suggesting that that be considered uh, because the, the, the clarity that we have received from the SQA is around the appeals process based on the um, estimated grade that uh, have to be submitted very soon, in fact, to SQA. I will double check. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Purvis. Thank you, Sheena. Can I now move to Councillor Donaldson? And I have one more councillor looking to ask questions. If you have any questions, please do let me know. If not, I will move to comments um, after uh, I have brought in councillors Donaldson and Barnacle. But Councillor Donaldson first, please. Thanks. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Councillor Good. Donaldson. Um, like so many others, Chief Executive, I'd like to thank you, Council staff and all the many volunteers for their effort and dedication over the last two months. And I think all oh, would be entirely in agreement on that. I want to change tack. I want to ask about pavements and roads. I think near term, the, the key issue is on pavements. Um, can I ask what progress is being made on that, not just in Perth City, but also in our towns and villages? And the real issue here is the question of the elderly, the very elderly, those who have had to socially isolate and be shielded, is that they, as we come out of lockdown, is that they have the confidence to be able to go out and about. Um, and you know, so it's an issue of social or physical distancing, however you wish to call for uh, term it. So can I ask what progress we've made on that front? And tied in with that, because I've had a number of representations, like many others, I'm sure, on cycling. And we have seen a very marked upturn in cycling over uh, uh, the last two months. Can I ask um, uh, what actions have been taken on that? Because uh, it's certainly something I, I think we want to support and encourage. 
OK, can I ask uh, Barbara Renton to respond, please? OK, um, thank you for the question, Councillor Donaldson. Um, the team, you know, sort of have been, you know, sort of actively looking at physical distancing measures. Um, the plan is that, you know, sort of within the next few days that um, consultation will be undertaken, particularly with the Perth members and the Blair Gowrie members, because all of the work has been done in terms of an early review of that. The team are then completing a number of activities for, you know, sort of some of the bigger um, towns across Perth and Kinross. And again, we will be consulting with the elected members in the first instance um, before we consult with community councils as well, before, you know, sort of we bring those into operation. The, in terms of cycling, yes, you're right, you know, sort of that it has been a huge increase, you know, sort of in terms of cycling across the area and you know sort of the the team are also working on proposals particularly for Perth at the moment um because that's where the bulk of the cyclists will be and enable to to keep the social dis the physical distancing but also to keep a support for people you know sort of who want to walk who want to cycle and are maybe a little bit afraid of using public transport as well um, you know, sort of so the plans for that are quite well advanced this morning um, the team are out, you know, sort of looking around Perth just to make sure that the ideas that they have are actually possible. They wanted to do a, a last physical check of that. And again, before that consultation, you know, sort of um, is goes out to the local elected members for that. What we need to consider as well that, you know, sort of that, you know, sort of there has been, been some concern that the Sustrans 10 million pounds money will just go, um, you know, sort of. But we have an embedded Sustrans officer who works with the traffic and network team. So we have daily conversations with them and daily conversations with Sustrans as a result. So they're looking on the proposals that we are going to bring to elected members very, very positively. So there would be an expectation that all of these measures would be funded. Can I thank you for that? However, can I just follow up in particular on the issue of pavements and roads? Um, you mentioned Perth, uh, where things seem to be, you know, quite a bit of progress and also Blair Gowrie. But there's the other towns and villages in Perth and Kinross. One particular point I would like to ask is this, and that is what degree of working together has there been with uh, Transport Scotland and Bear Scotland? And that's especially relevant in Strathairn, simply because the A85 to Creef, Comley, St Fillings, the, the A85 is under the um, control and running of, of Transport Scotland there. OK. Again, thank you for the question. Um, the, the group are working with TACTRAN and as a result, there will be links to um, Transport Scotland as a result of that. I think that the important thing to remember is that many of the traffic and network team are actually currently retasked as well. Um, a number of them are supporting the additional vehicle that we, we, we uh, introduced in terms of the recycling collections approach. Some of the staff, you know, sort of are actually double working because they're out in the areas and then coming home and recording that and then logging that, you know, sort of and then undertaking that work with the rest of the team as well. So I'm really grateful for the, the dedication of the team as well and doing, you know, sort of a number of activities actually at the same time as well. The plans are almost complete for our bigger towns, um, you know, sort of, and as I said, you know, sort of, and I'm looking at the chat, um, the first consultation in terms of Perth has already been undertaken um, and Blair Gowdy, I would imagine, you know, sort of is pretty close behind that, but they are in train, Councillor Donaldson, and we will get to every elected member as soon as we can. Uh, finally, just to say thank you, I think we can all understand the issues of staff capacity, uh, people double working, being redeployed. But I do think as we come out of lockdown, it is an important issue for the, in particular, the very elderly and indeed those who've been shielded. They do have to have the confidence to get out and about and that, that really matters. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Councillor Donaldson, and indeed for your words of support um, as you introduced your first question. Can I move to Councillor Stewart, please, and then I will move on to comments. So, Councillor Stewart. I thought there was a Councillor Barnacle first before me. Apologies, you're quite right. It's Councillor Barnacle first. Um, can you hear me, Chief Executive? Yes, I can. Thank you, Councillor Barnacle. Yeah, um, two questions, although one could really be in relation to the next item on the agenda, that's hybrid meetings. Um, only essential road repairs are being carried out at the moment, as I understand it. Um, but I did feel that um, given that uh, the roads are quite quiet at the moment um, is it not an opportunity to be dealing with uh, some of the potholes that we still got around the council area thank you councillor barnacle and um, i'll ask uh, barbara renton to respond to that but i've certainly received a letter from the uh, roads commissioner setting out what we can and can't do as a council but barbara you might wish to um, expand on that. Yes, thank you, Chief Executive. Yes, um, certainly, Councillor Barnacle, that would have been my um, plan as well. Unfortunately, we are only allowed to undertake emergency repairs because of the Scottish Government guidance and, as Karen says, the um, guidance that we've received from the Roads Commissioner. So we can't do anything but emergency repairs. Thanks for that, Barbara. Um, the other one on hybrid meetings, would you agree, uh, Chief Exec, that we should leave that to the next item? I think that would be helpful, Councillor Barnacle. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Um, thanks. I've got a slightly poor connection, so I'll leave the video off. Um, it was uh, just a follow up to uh, Councillor Bailey's questions to the Chief Officer and Director of Health and Social Care. Um, the uh, offline response that the um, chief officer and director said he was going to circulate uh, uh, or going to send to get back to Councillor Bailey on it would be maybe useful to have that circulated to all members um, but specifically there was an answer uh, there was a question about um, the double negative testing before um, somebody's released from hospital and I wondered whether that what the um, guidance was about the number of days between those tests it couldn't be um, two tests taken on the same day or in the same testing session, but but tested differently, could it? I don't recall the detail of the guidance to hand. I don't have it to hand, Councillor Stewart. Perhaps I could arrange for uh, it to be circulated to members of the council and, and for me to highlight um, the specific timescales that are used. My recollection is that it would be seven days apart, but I, I would really need to check that. Thank you. OK, thank you for that, Gordon. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. I'm now going to move on to comments, please. And can I ask Councillor Rebick, please? Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity, particularly uh, coincidentally, as I think it's National Thank a Teacher Day, uh, just to make clear our gratitude for all the work that officers in education and children's services are doing and our teachers and our early years practitioners and our support staff and indeed everybody that's been involved in making sure our kids are getting some education currently in these difficult times. I think Sheena's right, uh, homeschooling is no substitute for formal education, but I think we also need to make clear that teachers haven't been on holiday or anything, but neither have kids and neither have um, parents for that matter uh, and I think we're all just trying to make sure our kids get as much of an education as they possibly can. I think it's also important to note that recovery will be important um, but it's at this point it's vital that we make sure our kids are healthy and indeed alive in order to enjoy that process uh, and I think that that is something that we need to need to emphasise that we can only go back to school formally when it's safe to do so and in a manner that's safe to do so. If I can be um, a little bit parochial as well, I'd just like to add my thanks to everybody in my own community of 
Perth and North. Uh, let them for all have been doing sterling work. I think we've delivered, or indeed um, in terms of the community fridge and food deliveries, up to about 1,500 food parcels now. And prescriptions have been done uh, and loads of other stuff that uh, we, the community has really just uh, come together. And it's great to see. I'd like to pass my thanks on to Councillors McCool and Anderson for helping out with deliveries when it's gone beyond Perth City North. And indeed, there are two traffic wardens, frankly. It's not often traffic wardens get praised, but Tommy and Stuart have gone above and beyond in terms of helping our residents in Perth City North. And I'd just like to put my thanks to them on record as well. Um, and thank you very much, Cam. Thank you, Councillor Rebick. I'm sure that uh, Sheena will pass on your words of support to all teachers and staff working in schools to support our children and young people. And indeed, um, Barbara will pass on your kind words to the community's team. Can Thank I now bring in Councillor Lyle? Councillor Lyle, please. Thank you very much, Chief Executive. Um, just firstly, uh, before I make my comments was that uh, just to respond to Councillor Purvis's second question on business rates, it was just to say that I met uh, Ben McPherson, MSP, who's a Scottish Government Minister, dealing with uh, small business grants and business rates and raised exactly the same points with him last week. And hopefully we'll get a response from himself and the Scottish Government in the non too distant future. Going forward to comments, um, I just want to make clear um, my thanks um, to all the officers in the council who have gone well beyond their normal duties and roles um, throughout this emergency. I am aware of many working long hours and working seven days a week. Um, <clears throat> and it's just a um, testament to the, the good work um, of uh, our officers and um, really they deserve our gratitude. So again, just to be clear, I would like to, to thank all members of staff in the Council, whatever the role has been in this emergency, and equally whatever their temporary role has been in this emergency. Um, I'm aware many have gone above and beyond, well beyond um, what their expectations would be, and many of them I'm sure have enjoyed the opportunity to learn new skills. I'd also add that I've been speaking to other Council leaders throughout Scotland, and I'm absolutely in no doubt that we've been the envy of many, if not most of the other council councillors uh, in Scotland. So again, I would just like to, to uh, formally thank our officer team and all members of staff, whatever the role in the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lyle. Your words are appreciated. Can I now move to Councillor Braun, please? Yes, good morning, Chief Executive. Um, I just really firstly wanted to echo the thoughts of others uh, in thanking you uh, and your executive directors, the senior management team, all the way down the line for all the work that you've done. Uh, as Councillor, Sa Councillor Lyle said, it's well and truly above the call what has been done on this occasion. Uh, it must be difficult enough to, to run a council on the emergency lines uh, as your plans dictated, but to do so when you you can't actually meet people face to face, make it much, much more difficult to do. Um, I particularly want to thank you for the, the support you've given to the volunteer groups. Uh, I know in Blair Gallery there's a very complex volunteer group been set up by the Development Trust and the Community Council uh, with many, many volunteers. Uh, here in my area, Mount Blair, uh, there are 100 volunteers uh, set up by the Community Council and Development Trust, which equates to about a quarter of the community here. And they were in place within 10 days of this emergency starting. Uh, and they've got a lot of support from yourselves, which I, I want to thank. And I think that it's important to thank all those volunteers, not just in my area, but all over Perth and Kinross. Uh, there was a thought for many, many, many decades that community spirit had finally disappeared. But I think this has proved people wrong in seeing this come forward so quickly. Um, I had wanted to ask a question this morning about the, the grants, business grants, but my colleagues preempted me. So I really just wanted to comment and say uh, that although the figures that were quoted are excellent, it is the speed at which these grants have been processed which is important to people, not just that they got their uh, the responses quickly back, but they actually got the money into their bank account very quickly. And that's been a comment that's come back to me on many, many occasions from businesses, both in Billigary and up here in Mount Blair. Uh, and finally, on a, on a very personal note, I think um, with, with one sad exception, it's, it's very nice to see everybody here, although the 
in the ether somewhere. Uh, it's nice to know they're all back and here. So uh, that's my comments. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braun, and indeed thank you to all elected members for their words of support for officers. I think it's really important to note that um, officers have gone above and beyond, there is no doubt about that. But it's also important to recognise the amazing work of volunteers and indeed our community groups, as has been mentioned during this meeting today. Working alongside community groups and volunteers is what's made um, Perth and Kinross a real success in delivering and supporting for people across our communities. And finally, thank you, as I said earlier, to all elected members for your support, because together we've actually been able to really make a difference to people's lives. So thank you, everyone. Can I now turn to Councillor McDade and then I will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen, um, and uh, thank you to uh, yourself actually for the leadership you've shown, particularly with the sounding board and your partnership working with the elected members on that. I found that very valuable over the last six to eight weeks. Um, I really wanted just to comment on the um, fantastic way the officers have uh, dis dispersed the business grants, having had an overview of other local authorities um, and how long it's taken other uh, neighbouring local authorities to uh, get those grants out to businesses, uh, Perth and Kinross was recognised as leading the way um, in how quickly we were getting them out. And as Councillor Braun just mentioned, actually getting the money out to businesses is absolutely vital for these businesses to be able to stay afloat. Um, and it really has been recognised by businesses in my area anyway, and that's been appreciated. So really just to commend, uh, I know the council tax team have been, you know, working at five in the morning and this sort of thing to ensure that people are getting these grants. So, uh, you know, big thank you to them and all the other staff who are, you know, working at unusual hours to um, not put too much pressure on the IT system. Um, and I think it's just, you know, a, a good testament to the, the spirit we've got going in Perth and Ross, I know in my local area we've got Feldy Roo, which is delivering old folks meals and lottery coronavirus support groups. So, you know, there's a lot of volunteer groups supporting the staff uh, in these efforts. But I really just wanted to uh, thank you for the leadership you've shown and also uh, the council tax team. Thank you, Councillor McDade. I really appreciate um, your, your support and thanks. Um, one final comment from Councillor Parrott, and then I will move on. Chief Executive, thank you very much. I want to add my thanks to um, those of others for all the hard work that um, council staff members are, are, are doing. In particular, I'd like to draw attention to the system where councillors are feeding questions um, through Christina Flynn um, for response and action. Um, in my view, that system has worked very well. Um, all the questions I've asked on behalf of businesses, agencies or questions, I feel have been very promptly responded to and where actions have been required, those have been taken very quickly. So thank you on that score as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrott. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, elected members, I think that we've had a very thorough session. Thank you for all your questions this morning and indeed to my colleagues for their comprehensive answers to those questions. It's really important at a time like this that we have these opportunities to undertake both scrutiny and provide better understanding of all the activities that are happening across the Council to support our communities. So thank you for the opportunity and indeed your contribution um, for this agenda item. I'd now like to move on to the item on decision making structures, which is item four on the agenda. Um, under item four, there is a covering paper that has been discussed at the sounding board and agreement reached with all group leaders about the content of the paper. There are also some appendices there for your information and we've in the previous agenda item probably covered a number of points detailed in those appendices. Before I go into the detail of the paper, I'd like to um, set out very clearly that this is unprecedented and it's particularly unusual to have the chief executive um, effectively chairing what is a council meeting. So please be reassured that my role today in chairing is, is specifically because this is the first time that we have live streamed a council meeting in this way and done it virtually. 
and it is not my intention to continue uh, to chair meetings in this way into the future. Um, so I hope that gives some assurance and I will now move on to the actual decision making structure. So as many of you will know, on the 16th of March, in discussion with all the political group leaders under the Council's scheme of administration, which is section 15, um, we agreed that in order to respond to the emerging and urgent situation in the context of COVID-19, we would suspend all normal business proceedings and invoke emergency powers. And this mirrored the position that has been taken by many local authorities across the whole of Scotland. So weekly sounding boards were established with political group leaders as of the 3rd of April. And section 2.2 of the covering report gives you details of the weekly agenda items. At the earliest opportunity, we um, did a virtual planning and development management committee and that was held on the 29th of April. I have to say that we've had a number of inquiries from other local authorities commending how we did this. So my thanks to everyone in the team who were able to undertake that. Plans were also put in place for other quasi judicial committees, including licensing. We also have the first um, health and social care IGB meeting on the 29th of May. But I'd like to turn your attention, please, to section three of the report and specifically um, that we were intending to continue with emergency powers for the time being. Um, we are looking at continuing to have council meetings as they are scheduled for the remainder of the year and beyond. The next meeting, as you know, is on the 24th of June. In terms of committees, at the very earliest opportunity in agreement with the sounding board, we will try to have service committees up and running, but certainly from August we will be able to do that. As I mentioned, the sounding board meets weekly. We will also be establishing service sounding boards. Um, I'm sorry to ask this of you, but it's my intention to call elected member briefings during the summer period. So I will be asking you to give up your time during what would have normally been the summer recess to participate in briefings, particularly around finance for the council and indeed, as I mentioned earlier, recovery and renewal. I also mentioned a request to the sounding board group leaders to have um, political representation uh, in the member officer working group to take forward the recovery renewal um, work. So um, final point for me is in the paper, it notes the review of the emergency powers on the 30th of September. That is actually the latest date. Um, I would anticipate that in agreement with the sounding board and the political group leaders that we would move to resume normal democratic decision making at the very earliest opportunity. So I'm very happy to take questions and if I can start now, please, with Councillor Lane. Thank you, Karen. You actually answered the question, which was uh, if the 30th of September was a date that's set in stone or it could be a moving feast. So um, You've answered that and I'm glad to hear that it's just a, a, a nominal date that um, it may be extended uh, or it may be brought forward depending on how circumstances are. And uh, I welcome the, the setting up of the, the service sounding board committees as well because it, uh, it gives uh, other elected members a chance to feed in. So I'm afraid I don't have a question there now because you answered it. OK, thank you for that, Councillor Lane. Councillor Reid, please. Councillor Reid, please. Hello. Hello. Hi, so, sorry, Karen. Uh, again, I wish to congratulate everybody, but my question was actually just written in for Gordon from the last one, so I don't have actually a question about this at uh, this time just now. Sorry. OK, no problem. Thank you. Um, Councillor Forbes, please. 
Thank you, Karen. Surprising that you have uh, once again preempted my question. Your uh, powers are, are beyond what I even thought they were. Um, but could I just ask um, on section 3.4, uh, I know you've now clarified that that date of 30 September was just a nominal date. Would you be willing to change that to an earlier date to give the public some reassurance that there is an earlier date on the horizon that we may begin the process of getting back to whatever normality will be um, as we come out of this? And I would suggest something like the end of July would be a date I would be keen to see. So, um, Councillor Forbes, I think the first thing to say is that uh, we are making sure that everything we do in terms of governance is sitting alongside the other councils in Scotland. So, SOLAS are undertaking a piece of work to make sure that we're all doing very similar things. And um, I think I've already publicly stated this morning to give that level of public assurance that you are um, requesting that, yes, of course, we will look at the date. Um, as and when we possibly can. So we need to hear from the First Minister in terms of how uh, lockdown restrictions may be eased and we will respond accordingly. But I hope this morning's session for those who are watching live or those who may watch this on the Council website provides a level of assurance about the scrutiny um, to officers from elected members about all the activities that are happening. OK, thank you, Karen. Councillor Braun. Uh, thank you, Karen. I have two questions, if you don't mind. Um, the first relates to uh, Section 2.3. We, we were talking here about various things, um, and the Blair Gary Recreation Centre is part of it. Um, I, I would like to thank the, the, the various officers who've organised the, the virtual um, user reference group and have got that organised for people, which is, is very much appreciated. Um, my question really for this part was, um, have we started to see any sort of response? Is it working as we wanted it to do? Uh, and I appreciate the capital budget has got to be put back. That's that's fair enough. Um, but are the responses as we expected? And will we be able to generate onto the next phase? What will be the next phase? That's that's the first question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure if Sheena would be able to respond to that at this moment in time. Thank you. Um, can Councillor Braun, could you repeat? You, you were thanking um, officers for getting the, the user reference group up and running. I heard that, but what I didn't hear was the bit, the bit that followed that. Right, Sheena, sorry. I, I thank them for doing it. And I was just wondering, are we starting to see the response we expected from the people, the various groups, and what will be the next phase? After that, I, I said I appreciated the capital budget has been put back, so that, that's that, that's not part of it. But um, what would be our next phase to move it on? I mean, it's a very important thing for the people of Berg Area to appreciate. Absolutely. Um, I don't have to hand any information about the, the number and uh, content of any responses, Councillor Braun. But that, that is something that I, I can ask the team to do. What I don't remember off the top of my head is what the, the date was that we set for responses. That that was in relation, wasn't it, to the the initial designs. So I, I, I don't recall uh, when we, we set a date for that, but I, I'll find that out. And in terms of the next steps, then once the um, responses are back in, it would be the intention to go back out to the user group then with a summary of um, the information that has been gathered today. Thank you, uh, Councillor McEwen. You're saying the 25th of May. That's helpful to know. So at some point after that, we'll go back out then and with an indication of what the next steps will be in the process. Fine, thank you very much. Uh, my <coughs> second question, Karen, more for you, I suppose, and you preempted a little bit of it. It's to do with 3-4 again and this date of the 30th of September. Um, in my mind, the 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 the, the, uh, the council chamber lends itself to social distancing, uh, and this question obviously is, depends upon what guidance comes out from uh, the Scottish government. Uh, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind planning as well, which was the test bed for something like this. Um, the public, I think, prefer to see a physical uh, meeting. As I say, the chamber would lend itself to social distancing for committees, um, given. Uh, the, the, the necessary guidance from the the, uh, the Scottish Government. Could we consider putting in um, quasi-judicial committees in physical form earlier? Is that possible? I think we already have in terms of the quasi-judicial committee, Councillor Braun, they're mm. already being um, uh, set in train. 
In terms of the chambers for full council, we are getting some advice from colleagues about the physical distancing and whether the chambers would accommodate that. The other point to make, of course, is that council staff are currently redeployed and retasked in providing essential services. So we will need to get the right balance between um, resuming some of their um, substantive roles and uh, being able to support council and committee functions. Um, so we're certainly looking into all of that. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Robertson, please. Uh, thank you. Chief Executive, uh, stranger, this follows on from uh, Councillor Braun's question. Um, I'm talking. I'm thinking of the the virtual committees we've had, and I, I actually watched on YouTube the virtual committee of the Development Management Committee, which seemed to run quite smoothly, but there was no major applications uh, discussed. Uh, we have a major application in Kinross coming up, uh, Persimmon Homes second phase at Lathrow Farm for 169 houses, which is due to I'm told to go to committee on the 1st of July. Now there's been a huge hundreds of, of objections or, or comments on this application. It's a, it's a very contentious application. And, and my concern is that um, that application will be held virtually and not in a public forum. And I would urge that um, and, and would agree with what Councillor Braun has said, that if at all possible, uh, major applications like this should we should try and hold in a public forum, an open forum where, where members of the public, at least some of them, can actually be present and, and witness what goes on and get a chance to take part in the, the overall debate. OK, thank you, Councillor Robertson. Um, as I said, we will do our best in terms of when we can actually um, undertake uh, committees with people present in a room. I'll ask David Littlejohn to respond to your um, comment around major planning applications because we are working to Scottish Government guidance around that. David. Thanks for the question. Um, the, the, the Virtual Planning and Development Committee in, in April did consider uh, a major application, um, one in Creef for, for a significant number of houses by, by Ogilvy Homes, and the next meeting likewise is, is likely to consider uh, some major applications as well. Um, I absolutely appreciate it. It's more difficult um, theoretically for people to participate in the Planning and Development Committee remotely. But we have made provision for that. There was an agreement not to hear deputations at that first uh, meeting, but that's likely to be taking place at the, 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 the second one. So in any normal sense that the public can participate as they would in any normal planning and development committee. And likewise, as, as you're aware, um, that the, the public would be viewing with not, without uh, participating in the meeting in the chamber, and they can do that virtually as well. So we've replicated as faithfully as possible the, the, the experience, but you're, you're absolutely right. At some point, we would, we would want to go back to uh, wherever possible having that, that physical interaction, but, but perhaps not quite yet, as the Chief Executive was alluding to. If, if I might come back, Chief Executive, um, the, the, the applications that Mr Littlejohn refers to um, I looked at the one in Creef and there wasn't a huge, it may have been a major application, but there wasn't a lot of objections to it. Nothing like the, the ones, the one that's, that's likely to come forward for Kinross. So it's a completely different ball game. And I think when it's a major, I think well, there's a huge lot of public interest in um, that we should, we should um, do whatever we can to try and make sure that that's held in a public forum rather than, than it, it is a sort of wooden, uh, um, experience trying to follow it on on the internet is just not the same. So um, if it's at all possible, I would urge us to try with with major applications like the persimmon one to do it in a public forum. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Robertson. We'll certainly note your points and I'm sure David will be looking into um, how we do this when we are allowed to do so. Thank you. Um, I'll move now to Councillor Anderson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chief Executive. Um, I'll stick with the quasi-judicial um, uh, thing. Uh, we have LRB and we have development management that I have an interest in. Um, the uh, one thing I see, and I, I want a bit of clarity here, is that um, often uh, in development management there can be a deferment for site visit, as with LRB. 
Uh, however, I'm not convinced that uh, the guidelines state that, uh, that uh, if you read the papers and you think that there's issues that would be better solved if you actually physically saw the thing, you could go out and actually view uh, the development uh, before coming to committees. How does that, would that be classed as a travel that is required, it, you know, it's not, it's, to me it's essential travel to make decisions and perhaps this would solve a lot of this uh, rather than going for deferments, which means again you would have to go and travel and putting the thing back. So uh, I want to know what guidance would be on that. Okay, thank you Professor Anderson. I'll ask David to respond. It's a very good question. At, at the moment, the guidance is very clear that, that essential travel would not include um, site visits. So planning officers are not making physical site visits and the guidance as it stands would, would suggest that nor should elected members. Planning officers are using technology where po possible, electronic uh, maps, Google Earth, etc., to try and get a better sense of the site. But it will be constrictive, and if in some instances it's simply not possible to properly assess an application without physically visiting the site, then that application um, couldn't be determined in, in terms of equity and fairness. Um, and, and likewise, if, if elected members feel they're unable to um, make that judgment without seeing the site, that would need to be reflected as well. I am hoping that that guidance will change shortly, but at the moment that is the guidance and, and, and site visits are, are, are not regarded as, as essential travel. Can I ask a supplementary on that? With LRB, uh, the consultant that we use goes out and uh, visits the site and gives us uh, pictures of it. Uh, if this is not happening, how will the process work then? Uh, um, Lisa Simpson may be able to add more, but to my understanding, the LRB has not met and, and, and has, is not planning to meet, partly because of those those um, th th those issues at present. Ah, so therefore the 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 um, the, um sheet I have here with LRBs on it, uh, these LRBs won't take place. It was just I saw a LRBs a program for June. Uh, well, Lisa can probably uh, add more. The LRB obviously is run by, by legal services, but, but clearly if in order to determine a planning application from you requires the independent planning consultant to go out and do a site visit, then that, that person can't. If, if he can do so again, the same as a planning officer would um, uh, remotely and elected members can also help make that decision remotely, then there's no reason in principle um, why, the, why the LRB um, um, can't meet, but it would be a choice um, for, for the, the, the convener of the LRB to discuss with legal services the practicalities at this time. And, and bringing it forward. The Scottish Government has made provision clearly that, that any applicant wouldn't be disadvantaged in terms of appeal, um, uh, uh, the appeal process should the, the LRB not be able to, 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 to meet. Okay, thank you, David. I think there is an important point there that Councillor Anderson raises. So I'm very conscious of our time at the moment. I don't want to shut down the discussion, but I think there's potential for um, uh, legal services to consult with the chair of the LRB and indeed those on the Planning and Development Management Committee just to bottom out this issue and make the necessary arrangements as required. I'd appreciate that as chair of the LRB. I would appreciate that because, uh, uh, as I said, I, I was, I'm all ready to, to, to chair LRBs because it's important that we move these things Absolutely. forward. Um, okay. Legal services will be in touch with you, Councillor Anderson. If I can now move to Councillor McCall, please. Okay, Councillor McCall, thank you. Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear I me now? Yes, Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my question is on um, page nine of the report on the trade union meetings. Um, very welcome to see those being uh, convened. 
Um, I just note though that there is a third uh, trade union committee, which is the Corporate Health, Safety and Wellbeing Consultative Committee, that that's not been included. And I'm just wondering if there's a reason for that or if it's planning to be combined with the JCC, since many of the attendees and uh, both from the union side and the staff side are common and also uh, whether or not elected members who sit on those committees will be invited to attend as well. Thank you. I ask Karen Donaldson to respond, please. Thank you. Um, Councillor McCall, the, the intention would be to move to hold um, all three uh, committees uh, and take steps to do so for, for business to be considered. Um, the, as you know, there is a, a, a planned review for looking at um, the future role and remit of all three committees, but that review process has been um, suspended pending um, us getting back to a, a new normal. So um, please be assured we will look at dealing with um, health and safety matters um, in the Health and Safety Committee until um, that, uh, those arrangements are reviewed and you'll be involved in that as a member of, of these committees. And Councillor McCall, I can f confirm that the elected members who are parts of those committees um, would be invited to the GNCT and the GCC as, as per the usual process. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now move to Councillor Barnacle, please. Thanks, Chief Exec. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Councillor Barnacle. Yeah, it was just following up on the uh, points made by uh, Councillor Braun and Robertson. I wondered if uh, we could give some thought to possible hybrid meetings for full council or planning where it's contentious and there may be deputations. Uh, I, I know that the um, the uh, both parliaments are, are doing hybrid meetings where some people attend in person using social distancing and other people are happy to use the screen facility. Uh, ha has that been looked at or is it being looked at? Yes, we're considering all options at this moment in time, including looking at physical distancing within the chamber um, and uh, also hybrid virtual meetings. So we will certainly come back to all elected members through the sounding board as soon as we possibly can. Thanks very much. OK, Councillor Donaldson, please. Thank you. Uh... I hear what's being said about committees and it's set out the revised 2020 timetable in Appendix 4 on page 27. However, can I ask specifically on the Audit Committee? Obviously, there's not that many, uh, of any, uh, actual individual audit reports to consider and have staff redeployed undoubtedly, but it's a statutory position about the Council's annual report and accounts. What is the position with Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission? Um, what kind of time period do we have? But the second point, and I'm totally aware of the stresses and strains on the finance team, but I think it is an important reference document when we come this autumn to uh, at some point to setting the capital budget and quite probably a revised revenue budget. OK, thank you. I'll ask Stuart McKenzie to respond to your first point. And um, before that, I'll respond to your second point um, around revenue and capital budgets. It, we're waiting to hear if the UK are going to set uh, a revised budget and indeed Scottish government, whether they will set a revised budget. But nevertheless, it's my intention to do finance briefing sessions, as I mentioned earlier, potentially during the summer period. And indeed, we will have to look again at both the revenue and set the capital budget, uh, hopefully around about the September point in time, Councillor Donaldson. Thank you. And Stuart McKenzie, please. Thank you, Chief Executive, and good morning, Councillors. Uh, Councillor Donaldson, I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, I can. Just to address your question, we've had confirmation that um, the the timetable or the deadlines for publishing our annual accounts have been moved to the 30th of November, so that's an extension of two months. Our intention, however, and we've been in discussion with our exter external auditors, would be to undertake the process as far as we can uh, in accordance with our normal timetable. So 
I, I would seek uh, an opportunity to have a discussion with yourself and Councillor Drysdale in terms of the approval process for the unaltered accounts prior to submission. Right, can I just say thank you very much for that response. And you mentioned 30th November, but clearly there's a good chance we'll have long before that. I think that probably takes some of the pressure off yourselves. But I do think it's an important document, as I say, for the, the two almost certainly revised budgets. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Purvis, please. Thank you, Chief Executive. Um, this was a, a follow up um, to a certain extent to the point that um, Councillor Forbes made. Um, I support um, his view that we should be trying to get things up and running um, as soon as possible. Um, and the, the fact that you've acknowledged that as well, Chief Executive. Um, I suppose the point I would just make is that even if um, to a certain extent there are occasions where you and other officers have to make decisions um, quickly that would usually go to committee, um, I don't think that should stop us from um, having committees back up and running as soon as possible. I know that at the sounding board I suggested that um, we should have them after what would have previously been the summer recess. So I don't think that we should need to be in a situation where we say emergency powers will no longer be used and then committees resume, but that we could perhaps um, have a twin track approach um, for some period of time. And also I would, I would just say you mentioned about the need to take a national approach. Um, I would say that uh, I suppose my view would be that um, as long as we're following um, the law and uh, social distancing guidance that's in place, I don't see any uh, personally any reason why we shouldn't be deviating uh, in Perth and Kinross um, and taking our own approach um, as long as that is lawful and uh, if it is what we deem to be the most appropriate course of action. OK, thank you, Councillor Purvis. And I think um, through the sounding board, you are aware that I very much support um, resuming committees at the earliest opportunity. I welcome the clarity that you've just given around um, running emergency powers in tandem. And indeed, I note your point about the national approach. I think what I was saying was that we are just trying to make sure that we're all doing similar things. They don't necessarily have to be the same as you quite rightly point out. Councillor Jarvis, please. Yes, my, my questions on your desire to build an even better council, and it's something that I really support. Uh, I know you've put out an appeal and it gives the public a great opportunity to maybe influence the way forward in the future. But I just wondered, is it too early to have any idea of how many people are responding? It has actually just gone live, as you note, Councillor Jarvis. So I think at this moment in time, it's too early. Um, but we will come on um, shortly to a more detailed discussion about recovery and renewal and we'll share with you some ideas and take some strategic direction from elected members about how we engage with um, our communities. Thank you. Yes, and it would be good to get updates as, as responses come in too. Of course. Thank you. Can I move to Councillor McCall, please? Thank you, Chief Executive. Um, I realise that this comes very much uh, firmly in the recovery and re renewal section, but on page 15, when we're looking at the record of decisions in the paper, I noticed the suspension of council tax and um, rent arrears for three months, uh, starting at the, in March, which means um, when the three months are up, it'll be basically the end of June. I was wondering if I could have any updates um, or any idea on we're, what we're thinking about that because as many people are, are still in a position of in a lot of cases uh, zero um, wages and um, very unsecure financial position at the moment the, the the worry will start to mount very quickly if we start to go back into recovery of um, council tax and rent arrears so I was wondering if I could get a little bit of an idea of what the thoughts were on that. So thank you, uh, Councillor McCall. We haven't actually had the opportunity to discuss that, given it's not um, due to be looked at until the end of June. However, I appreciate for many um, members of the public and people in our communities, they will be incredibly concerned about their own circumstances. You will know that the furlough scheme has been extended UK wide until October. So I suspect that that will feed into our um, decision making in terms of whether we continue to uh, not pursue any rent or council tax arrears. But I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to give you a formal and definitive update at this moment in time, but we certainly will be looking at it shortly. Thank you. 
OK, there are no more questions, so I'm going to move to Councillor Wilson, who wishes to make a comment, please. Thanks very much indeed, Chief Executive. Just following on from the many um, complimentary remarks of the work done by all of the, 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 the council staff that I'd want to associate myself with, I think going, going forward um, and, and the decision making process, I think one of the problems with what we're doing now is, is that it's very in, labour intensive of a lot of staff time um, because and, and that includes the preparation and the, 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 the pre running of meetings. That's my first point. Secondly, um, I, I think we're, we're at the vagaries of the Internet system and it's unfortunate if some folk have to fall out of a meeting because of the Internet. Um, our IT staff work miracles, but you can only work miracles with what you've got. Um, and, and sometimes folks simply just can't get connected at all. So I think there's limitations on, on what we're doing and would support the, the, the thought of trying to get back to committees, albeit with, with appropriate social distancing, as soon as it's practicable and, 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 and legal. Um, bear, my second point is bearing in mind that the pandemic situation is going to go on for quite some time, and I have no better knowledge than anybody else in the room on, on that. Um, there's an issue about the health and well-being of our staff, including yourself, Chief Executive, and, and everybody else who works for the organisation, um, in that doing 60 hours a week or, or more um, is, is not fine at any time, but it's acceptable for a short period of time. Unlike other emergencies, this is a long, long term thing. And I'd like a reassurance that we will be looking at everyone in the organisation's health and well-being um, that on an ongoing basis that folks should have a break, they should have some time off uh, as is appropriate, because I think it's essential that folk keep their health, well-being and energy up for the, the fight ahead as well as the fight now. OK, thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, I can confirm that, of course, we will be looking and do so um, on a regular basis in terms of the health and well-being of all our staff. Um, there are a number of um, toolkits and resources available online to support staff at this moment in time during this crisis. And of course, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week and we're doing a lot of work around supporting staff in terms of mental health and well-being too. So thank you for your concern and indeed your support for staff well-being. But please be assured that we are looking at all of those things uh, on a regular basis. So, Thanks. councillors, if, if there's no further comments, um, I would like to propose that um, the comments that you have made specifically around um, an early return to committees is one that we would wish to see. Um, we will explore the use of hybrid emergency powers, um, should that be appropriate. We will look at physical distancing and face-to-face -face, um, committees and councils at the earliest opportunity. We'll seek early the resolution to the issues raised around planning, development management and indeed the LRB. And if and when we can review the date uh, in terms of emergency powers, we hope that will be long before the 30th of September. If we can review it after the 31st of July, we will absolutely do that. Um, so with those um, caveats in place, are you content to agree the paper? Agreed. 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 Yep. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Councillor. Bit late. Agreed. Thank you. Um, can I move us on then to the final item on the agenda, and that is the um, nomination to Planning and Development Management Committee. And Scott Henry, are you able to provide details of that? Yes, thank you. Um, I understand that the nomination um, is that Councillor Williamson be appointed to the current vacancy on the committee. OK, thank you, uh, Scott. Uh, Councillors, are you in agreement with this? Agreed. 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 So, councillors, that brings us to the end of the formal uh, business meeting. Um, can I just ask uh, Chris Wright to talk us through how to connect to a private meeting? And it's my intention to take a 10 minute comfort break, please. 
um, immediately after this, resuming in the private session at 10 past 